say um, we're kind of in the middle of, of, of a series of Bible studies. Last week we looked at Psalm 103. Tonight I'd like you to turn to Psalm 139. 139. Next week is our annual meeting, which is when uh, we kind of look back and, and review where we've been in the year prior and, and look forward to the year ahead. And then the following Wednesday night, we're going to start a new series that we're going to be in for a while. And that new series is The Life of Jacob in the book of Genesis. And I want to encourage you, you've you got a couple of weeks head start here to be reading about the life of Jacob. Anybody here find Jacob to be your favorite Bible character? <laughs> I don't think so, right? That's the, he's not one that we tend to be drawn to and have warm fuzzies about, um, which makes him intriguing because Jacob, remember God changed Jacob's name, gave him another name. Do you remember what it was? Israel. Israel. Yeah. Father of the 12 tribes. Okay. Very important figure in the history of, 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 of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament and a very important figure in the promise to Abraham as it was carried out uh, down through the centuries. So, so in two weeks, that's where we're going to be. And uh, I hope you're going to be reading ahead and, and checking that out. So we could have gone so many directions tonight. And... Uh, we're, we, we ended up landing, and I think some of you know this, on my favorite song. I mean, this is, so since I had one week, I thought, why not? Let's go for it, okay? And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Psalm 139 or you're not familiar with Psalm 139, but I, I hope it becomes very special to you by the time we're done tonight. It's a psalm of David. And we really don't know when in David's lifetime this psalm was written. Um, so it's hard to say what, what sparked this other than his relationship with God. So let's take a look. I want to read, I want to read the verses one through six are, are together, but I'm just going to read one through four and stop for a minute, okay? Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Pretty phenomenal things to say about God. But he starts with, oh, Lord, you've searched me and you know me. And there's a bookend here because at the very end, he ends with, search me, the invitation. Search me, oh, God, know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. In verse, verse 23, verse 24, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So the, the psalm begins and ends with the understanding of, of God knowing him. And David willingly, openly saying, you search me and reveal what you see to me. So when you look at verses 1 through 4, <clears throat> does anything strike your attention about what he's saying there? Anything catch you? God seems to be interested in the details. He seems to be interested in the details of our lives, doesn't he? We're an open book. <laughs> to God, we are an open book, Right? Even those of us who might tend to keep things to ourselves, even those of us who are maybe introverts that don't tell everything that's going on in their lives, we are an open book to God. You know when I sit and when I rise. As I look at that, I think he knows our actions. You perceive my thoughts from afar. He knows what we think. He knows our attitudes. You discern my going out, my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. That's patterns of behavior. He understands our patterns of behavior. Now, 
I don't know how you think about that, but if he understands our patterns of behavior, and if they happen to be destructive patterns of behavior, or if they happen to be destructive thoughts and attitudes, he's the one that can help us get things turned around, which is, which is very encouraging. But let me just ask you this. When you, when you take that in and you ponder it, what do you think about it? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it, is it scary? Is it, is it comforting? How, how do you take that in? It's a little bit scary. It's a little, in, in what way? Anything, any reason you might? And, I, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I don't always have the right thoughts and yeah. um, do, patterns of behavior. I don't always think the right things. I don't always say the right things. I don't always do the right things. So, exactly. so you, we can't hide that, can we? Well, you're not perfect. Not so yet. It <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just messed Steve's night up tonight. <laughs> I always held her on golden saddle. <laughs> It's refreshing. You I see mean, it as refreshing? I, yeah, because God, if he knows us that intimately, he's really involved with a minuscule piece of dirt on a planet of a billion planets. And he's interested in me getting up out of bed and eat what I'm going to have for breakfast. Mm -hmm. he's, yeah. And it, like her, uh, I kind of wish he didn't know all the words in my mouth because <laughs> sometimes it's not very... So sometimes, sometimes it's very refreshing. Sometimes it's very encouraging. Sometimes it's a little frightening mm -hmm. when you stop and realize God knows everything about us. <coughs> everything about us. And uh, especially when you think you're hiding something. Mm -hmm. Right? When you think you're, you're doing something or, or thinking something and and you're thinking, well, nobody else knows this. And then you stop and realize Psalm 139 tells you, well, yeah, the most important being in the universe knows what's going on. Uh, so you use open book. I, I think his omniscience is awe-inspiring, that he could know everything about every yeah. single person. <laughs> everything about everybody at the same time. Mm -hmm. That, that's only God, right? Yeah, that's why he's God. You know, I didn't read 5 and 6, and, and, and one of the reasons I didn't read 5 and 6 is I kind of wanted to just hear what your thoughts were about this. We're in Psalm 139, okay? Thank you. Uh, in verses 5 and 6, David gives his, his response, his reaction. You hem me in behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too lofty for me to attain. At least when he wrote this, David marveled at God's knowledge of him, at God's awareness of everything about David. And he found that a wonderful thing. Um, now, later on in David's life, or earlier, depending on when he wrote this, but when David went off the rails for a few years, uh, I don't know if he would have written that the same way. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me because, because God's hand was heavy on him at certain points in his life. But right now, he finds it wonderful. Also, too lofty to attain. It, it, it's like I, he, he can't, he understands it to a degree, but he can't wrap his mind around all of it. I mean, just like Julie said, he knows each one of us. And then you take that across the board uh, to, to everybody. I like the way my, my Bible says this. Such knowledge is beyond my grasp. There you go. Such knowledge is beyond my grasp. What translation is that? It's God's words of the nations. It's a, it's a, it's a translation done by a group of people. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Far beyond my grasp. Any thought, question that, that strikes you about that at this point? All right, let's keep rolling. It just gets better. 
So where can I go from your spirit? Verse 7. Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Now the word depth literally is in the Hebrew is Sheol, which is the realm of the dead. So if I make my bed in death, even, even there you are. My Bible says if I make my bed in hell. That that has uh, is that King James? You know? No, I know King it's, James uh, it's, uh, it's in some everyday Bible comments. Okay. Okay. It, yeah, that's that's the Mine's King James, it's the same thing. Yeah. I guess it um, says that. The King James translates the word Sheol as hell. Literally, it's the it's the realm of the dead. And I'm not gonna go way down this road, but do you remember the the, the the parable that Jesus told about Lazarus and the rich man, and he, and he talked about uh, Lazarus was at the gate of the rich man for all those years, and, and the rich man ignored him, and when they died, uh, the rich man went to, a to Abraham's side, I think probably translated to King James as Abraham's bosom, and then uh, the rich man uh, was, was in, it was, it was described as Hades, which is in the realm of, in, in Sheol, the realm of the dead, but it's, it's in that place uh, where there is no comfort. There, there, there is no sense of God's presence. And in the parable, you remember, the rich man is looking across, and, and he still thinks he must be better than, than Lazarus because he said, you know, Abraham, can you send Lazarus to warn my brothers? And, uh, and, the, and the parable goes on from there. But, but that, is, that is about the realm of the dead before Christ. It's a, it's a snapshot. It's a picture in a parable. Uh, so, and, the converse, and apparently in, that, in the parable, again, the rich man could see a cross. Mm -hmm. Now, we aren't told what that's going to be like once heaven and hell are established forever, okay? Uh, but that's, that's the image that Jesus was talking about. He goes on in verse 9, and he says, If I rise on the wings of the dawn, sunrise, right? If I settle on the far side of the sea, and he's thinking Mediterranean Sea, so when he's thinking about the wings of the dawn, he's talking east, far side of the sea is the Mediterranean west. So as far east, as far west as you can go, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So if you look at verses 7 through 12, what's the, what's the basic theme of what he's saying there? He's everywhere. You can't escape him. You can't run away from him. Not only does he know us inside out, he's wherever we are, wherever we go. And that, how, how does that strike you? Run, but you can't hide. <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. Yeah, Jonah tried that, didn't he? Jonah tried to run. And, uh, it didn't work too well. But on the other hand, it's uh, it's a comfort because no matter where we are, we are perfectly safe because God is right there with us. Yeah, I, I got to confess, Tom. I find this, I find all of this extremely comforting. I find it all, which is why it's my favorite song. I find it to be absolutely wonderful to think that there's nowhere I go, there's nothing I go through, that he is there. He's right there. In the midst of it all, yes, sir. One one line out of this caught me, thrilled me actually. Mm -hmm. It says, um, "Well, <laughs> okay, see, that was one thirty nine verses. That was seven through twelve. We okay. just read. It can, even even there, tell." 
shall thy hand lead me uh -huh. and thy right hand. <clears throat> Jehovah, who is the right hand of God? Yeah. And Jesus has got a hold of him even in the Old Testament. You know, it's a, I, that's a, I'm glad you brought that verse up because that's a verse that, that tells us he holds us right there, right? Remember John 10? Jesus is talking and he talks about the Father holds us in his hand and, and no one can reach in. Nothing can yank us out of his hand. And he says, and I hold you in my hand. And there's this picture, at least in my mind, of the Father's hand and Jesus and they're, they're like this, holding us firmly in, in their hands and nothing Nothing can take us away from them. And, and I, you know, no situation, not even death itself, can take us away from him. Not if we're his children, not if we're followers of Christ. And what, what, a, what a wonderful promise that is. And not only does he hold us, wherever we are, he's willing to guide us. He's willing to, to lead us along and show us the, the path that, that he wants us to walk. It's more than a little discomforting if you're walking outside of his will. Yes, it is. You're like, oh, no place to hide. Yes, it is. <laughs> it really depends on where you are, right? It depends on if, if you are in deep, close connection to the Lord. This is an encouraging, promising, hopeful song. But if you are trying to run from him or if you're trying to uh, ignore him, or if you're refusing to deal with things he wants you to deal with, for example, uh, in our lives, this can be a very disconcerting song. It's a reminder that you can't hide, <laughs> and he knows us inside out. Okay? Uh, so. This attention he's given us, though, is not just because he's omniscient, knows everything. He loves me. Yep. Loves me that's so a good much, point. And that's why he's that's why he's so close and paying so whether I'm on the right track or not. Yeah. That's that's a great point. His desire, it's not just because he's God. Being who he is and his nature is a nature that loves us. I mean, we're created in his image. We're designed to, to live in relationship with him. So this this isn't because he's just showing us he's God and and uh we can't get away with anything. He's showing us that he's God and he loves us and he cares for us and he wants to walk with us, which there's, there's no other religion on the face of the earth that even comes close to touching that concept. Not even close. This is God who came to us. And in verses 11 and 12, which we read, there's a couple of ways to, you know, to look at that. Surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, but even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, and, and I think literally he is talking about day and night. I think he's talking about, you know, even, even in the darkness, God is with us. But I think he's also talking about times of spiritual darkness, times when, for whatever reason, we feel far from God. And, you know, we may have a heart for God. Have you ever been through, as sometimes they're referred to as desert experiences in your life, when, when you, you're seeking, you're longing, you're yearning, but you're not feeling it. You're, you're, you're not, it's not that emotional sense that you get a lot of times in your relationship, and you kind of feel far away, feeling-wise. But this is reminding us he's there. We he's get that feeling he's and, and, it, and this could be a time when we don't feel it per se it's, it's kind of like Campus Crusade crew used to have this, this uh, little train that they had like a cartoon and the, and the idea was there's the, the engine is fact and then the caboose is feeling and you don't want to put the feeling in front of the fact. You don't put the caboose in front of the, the engine. Every, you know, we live our lives based off of truth. When I say fact, I'm talking truth. 
You know, we live our lives based off of what the Word of God says. And if the Word of God says, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day. That's, that's the reality. We may not feel it, but that's the promise, and that's the truth. When God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that's the promise. That's the truth. And we hold to that even if we don't feel it. And I think I, what I see, this is an observation, all right? I see far too many Christians who get that turned around. And they're depending on feeling. And listen, I love feeling more than, as much as anybody. I love the sense that he's right there. I, I love those experiences in worship when I just... I'm overcome by emotion. I love, whether it's in, in a corporate worship or out walk, walking in the woods or or reading the word, and man, it just hits you and, and warms you and, and, and just moves you. I love that. But that's not the basis of our faith. The basis of our faith is truth. And we might go through a time when, for whatever reason, you know, we feel like our prayer is not reaching beyond the ceiling. We we feel like God is a thousand miles away and not with us. But that's not truth, that's feeling. You see what I'm saying? And, and we really need to keep that in mind because too many times I, I've, I've watched people struggle in their faith even to the point of, of wanting to turn away and maybe turning away because they're not, quote, feeling it. And, and even, even salvation experiences, sometimes they're very emotional. Sometimes they're just coming to a point of understanding the truth of who Jesus is and saying, man, that's what I want for my life. I accept you, Lord, as my, as my Savior and Lord. Very different experiences. A book, I don't know if it's in print. If you ever get a chance to get it, it's called Conversions. One word, Conversions. And it's, it's a collection of testimonies down through the centuries mm -hmm. from the Apostle Paul, uh, Peter, all the way up. This was written many years ago, so you better get the latest ones, but all the way up through. And it, what's fascinating when you read it is that everybody's experience in coming to Christ is a little different. You know, it's not cookie cutter. God's not cookie cutter. Yes, sir. Um. Perfect, solid gold. Um, when I gave my life to Jesus, I gave my life to Jesus alone in my room. And you know, remember those little tracks they used to hand mm -hmm. down? There was a prayer back of those tracks. And I had made up my mind that I'd seen Bhagavad Gita and I'd seen all this other stuff. And this is the one that it was alive. Yeah. So I prayed my, the salvation prayer and embraced Christ. And uh, 500,000 fireworks went off in the front yard. 15 cars wrecked up there. The Loch Ness Monster came out of the, out of the cover. Nothing happened. I felt exactly the way I did before I prayed the prayer. But as time moved on, I knew. Mm -hmm. You know. But it's like you, what you were saying. Sometimes people, people will say, well, didn't you feel a fanfare? Well, didn't you feel a... A huge surge. And, and that wasn't your experience. No, I took yeah. God at his word. And other, and other folks, that does happen. You know, they, yeah, and I'm the fireworks, yeah, the fireworks go that, off. That, that just because something like that didn't happen right. doesn't mean that Jesus didn't hear you Absolutely. and he right there with you. Absolutely. Yep. Any other thoughts on this? I think that's a really important point because I think a lot of people think they're just supposed to instantaneously get hit in the head with the Holy Spirit and oh, yeah. this is it. And, and, and it doesn't always happen that way. And, and, it's really, it truly, it truly is different for everybody. People need to know that. And I, and I, think, I think that's something that, that we probably need to do a better job at as, as Christians is telling our stories. Being comfortable enough to tell our story. How we came to know the Lord and, and what it was like for us. How did we know? What was it that made us know and trust that Jesus is who he says he is. and um, I just think that's crucial that all of us know our story and can, can share it with, with one another. Well, let's keep rolling. 
because we've got a ways to go in 15 minutes. <laughs> For you created my inmost being. Verse 13. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Beautiful verses. Beautiful verses. What, what do you hear David saying in those verses? A lot of praise. What's he, what's he praising God about? Even before he was born, God knew him. Yeah. God was there in the womb. Right? He was there when we were being knit together in the womb. What a, what a beautiful image. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting. And, and For you created my inmost being. What, <laughs> what, what do other translations have? Verse 13, opening words. You created my inmost being. Inner being. Formed my inward parts. Okay. Thou hast, thou hast possessed my reins. Okay. Well, the word used translated in the NIV as created is not the word that is used like in Genesis 1 when it talks about <coughs> creation. It's actually, and the wife and I class looked at this a few weeks ago, uh, it's actually the same word used in Genesis 4.1. In Genesis 4.1 it says, Adam lay with his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord I brought forth a man. The idea, the word translated in Genesis is the idea of brought forth. It's the same word that's used right here, translated created in verse 13. In other words, God was in the process. Now, clear. I think we even had the conversation in the, in the Sunday school class that, that day. A couple of folks thought, that's a little bit of a strange statement to make, that, that, that uh, Eve was saying it was me and the Lord that brought forth. Well, I mean, she was just pointing out God was involved in the process of, of bringing that life forward. Uh, obviously, it was Adam and Eve that, that took the necessary steps to make that happen, okay? <laughs> Uh, but God is in the midst of that. And that's what I hear David saying there. Would somebody real quickly look up Jeremiah 1. Jeremiah 1 verses 4 and 5. And just read it in a nice loud voice so everybody at home can hear. Jer Jeremiah 1 verses 4 and 5. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. All right, so what's Jeremiah say? God was right there when he was formed in the womb, and God called him to be the prophet. Okay? That's pretty, that's pretty fascinating. You know? Life in the womb. That's a baby. Plain and simple. Okay? And it's, it's beautiful. It sounds like he's creating your soul. That's a, that's a, that's a wonderful thought. Before he, before he actually makes Because we're life. created in his image, right? Yeah. And when it talks about made in the secret place, woven together in the depths of the earth, that's, that's just a reference to the womb. Right? Mm -hmm. I've, I've mm -hmm. always loved verse 14. Mm -hmm. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And I know we have a lot of nurses in this congregation, but I am, I just get astounded when I think how the body works together, Absolutely. the chemical processes, <coughs> the neurological processes. I mean, yeah. it is astounding. Yeah. And that, that verse has occurred to me many, many times. Yeah. That there's no way we you no, nothing was, was a happenstance of the cosmos. No. You know, we no. were planned. Yeah. And and every single part of our body works with every other 
if all you have to do is be nice and have this part start to fall apart, then <laughs> that's another When these reason. parts start falling apart, you realize they're meant to work together, but, right? But it really is, it, I just, I'm, I'm just astounded by that, and yeah. I've always loved that verse. That's a beautiful verse. I, see I thought you were going to say something. I see it here as an action word, too, because we were in God's mind before we were ever in yeah. our mother's womb. Yeah. But at this point, he's saying, I created. He put that mind yeah. into a body. Yeah. Yep. He, he, yeah, he's been there all along. He knew, he knew us before, before we ever came along. I can remember being in a biology class. Now, this, this would have been, I'm dating myself. This would have been about, oh, I don't know, uh, mid-70s, okay, at, at WVU. And, and truly, the, the, the professor, he was, he was going through the stages, the stages of, of a baby developing in, in the womb. Uh, and, but I, I think it, he was really trying to show, he, because at the very, very beginning, he, he put a picture of a tadpole up there and, and just kind of making it look like, you know, see, we're pretty much the same <laughs> until, you, until you start going through the, the process. And I can remember walking out of that class thinking, you know what, you were trying to mess with my faith, but, but, but when you showed me the pictures in the womb, you just, you just brought me closer. I say, and that was before. That's long before what we know now, what we see now in the womb. Uh, it, it's, it's incredible the images yeah. that we see with ultrasound and cameras. And I mean, my goodness, talk about no privacy for that little baby. <laughs> so we see that little baby growing, and, and it, it's fascinating. Well, it, let me just kind of move along here because, because of time factor here. Verse 17 and 18, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. And when I'm awake, I'm still with you. David is overwhelmed by God's knowledge of him and who God is. He is just, he's at a loss for words almost at this point. Now I have another verse I want somebody to look up because this blows my mind when I think about it. Would somebody look up 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16 and read it? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16. 2, verse 16? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Who has known the mind of the Lord so that he can teach him? Go just a little further. However, we have the mind of Christ. Yeah, that's what blows my mind. Okay, that was kind of separated. Who has known the mind of the Lord that we might teach him? But Paul says, however, we have the mind of Christ. Does that not just kind of pierce you <laughs> with what he's saying there? What would he mean by that? Because here... Uh, David is just overwhelmed by thinking about what God knows and, and about us and, and who God is. And, and then Paul says, you know, who are we to think we can counsel God? But then he turns around and says, but we have the mind of Christ. What is he talking about? What was that? Um, 1 Corinthians 2.16. 2, 16. Yeah. The mind of Christ is God to us. And then it would teach us how to communicate with the Father. How do we, okay, so as we think, how do we have the mind of Christ? Okay, the mind of Christ guides us, but how is it we have the mind of Christ? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We're created in his image, and when we come into relationship with him and embrace Christ as our Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit literally comes to dwell in us the Holy Spirit of God. The, I mean, we're talking about the third person of the Trinity inside of us who gives us insight into his word, who gives us guidance and wisdom as we need it. I mean, we have the mind of Christ. 
not that we are Christ. Don't, don't, yeah, we're not saying that. We're saying we have, I mean, if you have the Holy Spirit, you got God, right? He's there to guide us, teach us, show us. Not that we can begin to think we understand everything he does. We don't. Because we, like Paul, we're astounded by who God is. But his, you know, I think from the very beginning, and I think Tom started it when he talked about, about this is, from the opening words of this song, it's an image of God's love for us. And it's not just the fact that he's God, he's on a mission. He loves us. And he loves us enough to create it, to create us to know him. We're built to know him. We're designed to know him. And we aren't whole until we know him and walk with him. Okay? And then, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing through this now. Then you come to verses 19 through 22. And I've always thought, come on, David, you could have left this out. <laughs> but here he goes. If only you would slay the wicked, O God. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies, which might tell us the motivation behind his writing this song. This might have been what was happening in his life at this time. It might have been one of those times when he was on the run and everybody was after him, and he was hearing them talk about foreign gods or pagan gods and, and, and denouncing the name of the Lord and his life is on the line, Israel's on the line, you know, who knows. But, but at that point, he wants God to know, I'm yours, I believe in you, and, and I stand opposed to those who stand opposed to you. I think that's the point he's trying to make here. Now, that's a rough one, especially when you think about what Jesus just said in the Sermon on the Mount Sunday, right? Yeah. You've heard that it was said. Uh, I, well, hey, let's, go, let's go beyond that. Uh, the other cheek. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Well, David hadn't quite gotten that message yet, <laughs> okay? But there's but one other thought real quick on this. He's also speaking as a king, or a king to be, and, and a warrior. Remember, that's the reason David wasn't allowed to build the temple, the blood that was on his hands. So he's speaking as a warrior and as a king. And, and you read, remember, we finished Sunday's sermon with Romans 12, verses 17 through 21. Where he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, you know what the very next chapter is. The very next chapter talks about uh, our response to governing authorities. And it talks about the responsibility of governing authorities to protect its people. And so part of that protection is, is literally holding accountable those who do wrong. Those who threaten. All right? So... When he, you know, what we were looking at Sunday and in Romans 12 is really at the individual relationships we have. But when you get into authorities and nations, there's, a, there, there's also a God-given responsibility there to protect and to do the right thing. That doesn't mean that governments always do the right thing, clearly. But that's the mandate. That's the call of God. But you got to love it. David ends up with the invitation. Search me. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. How many, how many of us are willing to invite God to do that? That's courage. That is great courage. Search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. Wow. Wow. That's just coming clean, isn't it? So he, he, he's writing his heart, but he's also saying, Lord, if I'm, if I'm doing something, or if, if my mind, my attitudes, my words, my thoughts, if they aren't where you want them to be, show me. And lead me in the way everlasting. That's a, 
That's a great prayer every day, isn't it? To invite God to search us. A lifetime us. worth of work. Yeah. And it works when we're open to it every day. Right? That's how it works the best. Any last words? Just like he's elaborating on his enemies in Psalm 140. In Psalm 140, he, talk, he talks about the enemies. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to know if it was actually psalms meant to be together. Mm -hmm. Julie? Well, I'm looking at this. Kind of what I go back to is Psalm 51, mm -hmm. wherein he says, uh, Create me a, a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Created me a, a pure heart, a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's beautiful. Psalm 51. That's a beautiful verse. Do you think that the violence, and, and there was vicious violence that David had seen, possibly even uh, participated in, the flip side of that coin gave him the courage and the, and the, the spiritual, spirituality to write these? You know, because he's seen the horrible stuff. Everything, every experience in life, this is true for anybody, for us to, the experiences we have in life give us the perceptions often that we have and then the conversations with God that we have based off of that. I mean, that's all who we are. And he knows, and the nice thing is, Psalm 139 says he knows all of that. Yeah, and he's like not a, take, he's, like he's taking a paint scraper to himself, you know, he's, he's like, He's yeah. willing to let God work and do what needs to be done. And, that, and that's a great example for us. Okay. Next week's the annual meeting. The next week is Jacob. And we'll get started on Jacob in Genesis. All right. Can I pray with you? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for our time. For those that were here in person, for those that are with us streaming. God, I thank you for this wonderful song. May we find great hope. May we find reassurance. God, may we not shy away from the reality and the truth of this song. May we embrace it for our lives. May we allow ourselves to be that open book before you. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.